Hope you guys can see me and hear me all right. Please let me know. Ah, happy Wednesday. Thanks for joining in. I uh, felt really inspired to talk more about something that I've been holding back on sharing for quite a while. Hi Elise, welcome, welcome. Um, so for those of you guys who have been following my channel, um, maybe for some years, you might have heard me talk a little bit about this topic, what I grew up with as a child and how my household was and having addiction in my family and a lot of these different aspects. I haven't talked about it much uh, recently and I've also avoided talking a lot about it in detail because of respect for my family members that are involved in, um, you know, privacy and other reasons. But I was thinking to myself just a few minutes ago before I came on live what I was going to talk about today and this just really popped up inside my heart to talk about. So um, bear with me. It's going to be very stream of consciousness, but there's a lot that I wanted to open up about today and share. So I hope that um, it it resonates and at the very least gives you more insight onto who I am and how I became who I am and you know what, what drives me and all of the things that I'm still working on and still learning about. Um, welcome Saranka, Crystal, Mike, Eric, thanks for joining everybody. Um, so I am now 26 years old, crazy, um, but since the age of five until basically until I moved out of the house um, at 18 and I, I moved to Ecuador, I had a very tumultuous childhood, so to speak. Um, and, you know, a little disclaimer, this is not, this doesn't encapsulate my whole story, right? Not, you can't just share one aspect. I had, I had beautiful things, so many beautiful blessings and gifts in my life growing up and a lot of, still a lot of joy and a lot of happiness, you know, and a lot, so much blessings, but there was also a lot going on behind the scenes for me in my life that was abnormal, so to speak, or um, you could call very difficult or traumatic. And so I wanted to open up a little bit about that and what I've learned from it and what I'm still learning from it, because I think that this is more common you know, way more common of an issue than people like to talk about. And addiction is, is so common in our society. It's so fervent in so many of our different families um, and structures, you know, of our lives. And so we all have impact. We, a lot of us have impact of this in our lives and it affects us in so many different ways, but especially in relationships. And that's what I'm going to talk about and how the effects of living in a alcoholic or addictive household can really play out in our relationships, our, our relationships and our codependency in our lives. So that's what I'm going to get into today. Um, feel free to ask questions along the way. Please just try to keep it respectful. As I go along, I would really appreciate it. Um, yeah, Crystal, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's a lot of people that have had similar, at least to a certain extent, experiences in their life. Um, and quick, quick little side note before I dive deep, um, you guys might not have seen my last video. I'm actually doing a workshop in December on December 5th. It's going to be a three hour workshop all about how to build our spiritual and physical immunity or sovereignty. And it actually does completely relate to this topic, which I'll try to explain. Um, but a lot of, a lot of our strength and both physically and mentally comes more from our emotional body and our beliefs than the physical, right? And so we're going to be talking a lot about that in the workshop and how these kind of things um, have a major effect on us and can have, have a major effect on our immune systems as well. So whether you have had this exact story or not, I'm sure you've been affected by negative relationships in your life or abusive relationships in your life. 
I am sure you've been affected by abusive relationships um, or kind of soul soul sucking relationships of even the society that we're living in, educational systems that we live in, workplace, you know, that you might be a part of. And so that workshop is really going to focus on tangible, real ways we can build ourselves back up, build back our strength, our power, our sovereignty um, for our physical health and for our mental health. That link is in my last video and I'll share it after after the stream or Saranka, if you have the link, you can share it in the comments. That would be awesome. It's an event right where you can get the tickets. But all that being said, let me get into this. And thank you, Jesse. I appreciate your your uh, gift. Much appreciated. <laughs> always, always appreciate the, the abundance. Um, so from five, five years old or so, my my family member got severely addicted to medications from a surgery and it kind of turned our whole world upside down, my whole world upside down. And a part of this was not only the abuse of prescription medications, but alcohol as well. But more importantly, actually, the underlying hardest part about it, I think, and the scariest part about it was what was behind that addiction, right? And what drove that addiction. And this family member really, really struggled with anger in particular. And so my house became a really scary place to live, really scary place to live. I never really felt safe and coming home. I didn't feel safe in my room. I didn't I didn't have an idea, I don't think, of what safety really felt like for a many number of years. Um, that was my normal, you know, that was my normal. I would really be um, in panic and fight, fight or flight response, right? High stress response happening in my body when I would be at home and when I would be in a number of situations that would usually play out most days of the week with my family member. Um, and my house was, it was a really scary place to be. There was a lot of verbal, really, really severe, just verbal abuse happening. Um, some physical abuse as well, mostly directed not towards me, towards my brother, which was very difficult in itself because I felt as the older sister, this role that I played um, was the protector, right? I felt like I took upon this role for myself um, that I had to manage this situation. I was the manager, you know, like I was the, I was, I was trying to direct the chaos at all times. Um, my, you know, my mom took a kind of passive role as well during that time. So I really felt like I had to step up and become this um, force in my household, become this protector. And so I didn't really, feel like a kid, you know? I didn't feel like a kid um, in my childhood. And this was hard. This was really hard in my relationships with even my friends and classmates because I never felt like I was uh, understood, you know? I wasn't, I, I was like, these kids have no idea what, what, what life is really like, right? And I had all, the, all this darkness and heaviness weighing on me, you know? And I would have really bad anxiety at school and of course at that time as a kid you don't know what anxiety is especially back when I was a kid that wasn't even really a thing that we were aware of so I would have stomach aches all the time and be in the nurse's office almost every single day with really bad stomach aches because of how bad my anxiety was and um in my household I was always trying to direct the violence towards me because I felt that there was so much pain, like, it makes me emotional to even talk about, but like there was so much pain that I witnessed and as a very highly sensitive empathic person for the people that I love the most, my, my mom and my brother in particular, it was so unbelievably difficult for me to watch them hurt, be hurt, and so I did whatever I could to take that stress off of them, to try to take that burden. And of course that didn't work, right? But in my little 
mind, that was my mission in life was like, how can I direct this towards me instead? I don't, I would do anything to make it stop for my brother, to make it stop for my mom. So I developed a lot of strategies. I developed a lot of <clears throat> strategies about how to survive and how to try to shield myself from what was going on. And so you can imagine how many different coping mechanisms that develop from these kind of experiences at a young age um, in these formative years, right? And I think if I had to summarize some of them for myself that I've worked on and been away f or working my way through over especially the last six years of being on my spiritual journey was my need to control for sure because everything in my life was out of control so I tried to control whatever I could what that looked like for me was myself being highly critical of myself holding myself to extremely impossible standards um trying to be a perfectionist in everything I did, especially school and relationships, um, being a people pleaser. And it's funny because I used to not consider myself a people pleaser because I'm very, I was always very outspoken. You know, I always, I always spoke up for myself and others and I always was able to say no. So I thought that me meant I wasn't a people pleaser. Wrong. Wrong. There's actually so many ways that people pleasing manifests that I've been learning about more with holistic psychology over the years. And Part of that is um, managing other people's negative emotions, right? Like doing anything we can to make sure there's no conflict, avoiding conflict at all costs, having really, really high anxiety when somebody is upset with us, if somebody even criticizes us, anything like that. And if somebody that we love or that we're in relationship with is upset in any way, like we feel we have to fix it or manage it immediately. So it's a very, it's, it's a trauma response, right? Um, and so a lot of those patterns were major, major part of my day-to-day -day life um, over the years growing up, especially in high school, pre-spiritual journey, pre-India. I had really a lot of these, a lot of these things weighing on my, on my soul, you know, and I felt very, very socially anxious. I felt very, very heavy just carrying around all this kind of um, suffering, but also anger. Like I did, I, if I'm being real, like I had a lot of anger um, about it all too. And that's something I, I used to not even be able to say. Why anger is such a shamed emotion is I don't know, right? But in our society, I think we feel a lot of times like anger is the least lovable emotion, right? And I was really angry. I was really angry for what happened to me. I felt a victim in a lot of ways, you know, to my life, to what happened to me, the abuses that happened to me and to my family and the falling apart of my family, my parents being divorced, be you know, because of all this, my mom being a single mom, you know, a lot of my adolescence because of this and financially massively struggling um, as a result as well. So, a lot of these stresses were just, you know, being carried by me. So I felt like I was, I was an adult in a lot of ways. Like I didn't get to have this carefree mentality as a kid. Um, I was always thinking about these things and always carrying these things with me. So yeah, I had a lot of, a lot of hurt, a lot of hurt that drove me to spiritually seek. Right. And that's why, like, I mean, with, with every cell in my body that this life experience I know I chose and I don't see it as a negative thing anymore genuinely because I know it drove me and motivated me to be the person that I am and to drive me to um, find the truth the truth of of why I'm here and what life is and who I really am you know at a, at a consciousness level um, that I would never have, I would never have felt so motivated to do. Um, being, you know, that I reached a point, I reached a point uh, where I would say, especially in high school, most of high school, I was very, very anxious, um, pretty depressed and just emotionally unstable in so many different ways. Um, and 
I had many times, like many, many, many times, I contemplated not living. I thought about it a lot. I thought about it a lot. I thought about just the why. Why am I even doing this? Why am I even here? Like, is this really what life is, you know? Um, and I questioned everything. It made me question my reality, which was actually, you know, a beautiful thing, but I didn't feel that at the time. Um, and it felt really dark. It felt really dark. And I started to see see a light at the, through all this simply because of my relationship to God. Um, and at the time, I definitely related to that entity, that source as, as capital G-O-D, because that was what I grew up with. But I felt that presence throughout all of it. And that's what kept me kind of kept me going, even when things were really hard. I really struggled with hurting myself um, internally, mentally, and emotionally, but also even sometimes physically in small ways, I would try to take away from my emotional pain um, by like scratching myself and doing and like doing different things like that where I, I really, really um, needed an outlet. I needed an outlet. And so when I left, I finally felt like this liberation for me. You know, I was like counting the days as a kid where I'd be free. I never felt free. I never felt free and I never felt safe. And so I was kind of counting the days until I turned 18. <laughs> Not gonna lie, I was. I was really counting those days down. And I always fantasized about it, what it would be like to be an adult because I felt like um, as a minor, my power was really taken advantage of. I, my lack of power was very taken advantage of in my household. And I felt, you know, mentally like I was already an adult in so many ways and I just, was longing for that. I was longing for that um, moment where I could be independent, where I could be free, where I could be in my own space and feel okay. So after high school, I did a gap year, as a lot of you guys know, and I moved to Ecuador. And that's where my journey really began. I finally was, I was alone. I was safe. I was living in a little village household with all women, the most loving Ecuadorian uh, indigenous women and just, completely isolated and it was terrifying <laughs> of course it was terrifying it, it made me uncover a lot a lot of junk that was sitting inside of me a lot of pain and a lot of anxiety and things that were sitting inside me but I was bringing them to the light and I was journaling about them and I was seeing them and I was praying and I was meditating and I was in nature all the time and it was just started to be so healing for me and that's really what kicked off you know, everything for me, everything for me. Um, but what I do notice and what I do see, I'll kind of try to bring it full circle here. Um, for a lot of us who have been in households with addiction, um, with trauma in general, right, is that we have a lot of codependency and that we manifest in our relationships. And I've been doing just so much reflecting on this over the last few years about what this really looks like and the the ways that we the ways that we uh, attach ourselves to people in unhealthy ways and the ways that we try to um, you know we we use relationships as um, a a mask but also sometimes like we have these false ideas about how another person can give us safety or give us security when nobody, you know, nobody is here to play that role for us. And that's not a, not necessarily a bad thing. It's something that has been really hard for me to accept. Um, but also it's really liberating when you do, because you know that you're only going to find that in yourself. And that when you establish yourself in that, that you're able to actually have relationships and it's so much more of a loving and free way. Um, and, and by no means I've perfected this, but I can say I've come come a long way and I, can, and I can definitely attest to the fact that the more we move out of this out of these codependent tendencies, people pleasing tendencies, we we know ourselves deeper, we know what we need, we know what our boundaries are. We're able to really show up for ourselves in so many you know better ways and others and and others and our relationships become so much, so much more radiant and so much happier and so much healthier. Um, and there's a lot more I wanna talk <laughs> on this topic. 
And I'm going to be talking about this a lot in my workshop, actually. Of course, I won't share so much personally about my backstory and all that. Um, I appreciate you guys listening to that. Um, and, and yeah, I, I just, I'm excited to talk about how, how we sometimes allow relationships, whether it's with parents, other family members, friends, or significant others to violate us or drain us and, and how we can stop doing that, how we can stop doing that and start empowering ourselves to, to live in healthy community and healthy relationships with ourselves and others. We're going to talk a lot about that because in Ayurveda, the concept of ojas, ojas is like sometimes translated to vitality, our essence, our immunity. It's not just immunity in the way we say in English, right? Like the ability to fight off disease or pathogens, but it's also the the spiritual immunity, the emotional strength that we have, that groundedness in who we are, and the ability to have abundant, blissful, and healthy relationships in our lives. So all of this I'm going to touch on, and I'm, I'm really, really, like, I can't tell you how excited I am to talk about this topic, because it goes so much deeper than meets the eye. It really does go so much deeper than, than meets the eye. Um, and so I would love to see some of you guys there, especially you guys I'm just seeing now in some of the comments to uh, who, who are relating to this, right? I think there's just, it's so beautiful to bring more and more awareness um, and give ourselves the tools as we can, so we can lovingly support ourselves through this growth, through healing the trauma, through healing the shadows, and also stepping into the light, stepping into the new ways of being, right? Rewriting, reprogramming ourselves. Um, and it helps to have community. It helps to have community to do that. So I'm excited to connect with you guys in a deeper way. Um, let me try to see if I can get back to the comments here. Sorry, I missed some of them. Um, thank you guys. I really, appre I really appreciate uh, you guys being here and listening and sharing your own stories. And I'm sorry to hear that, honestly. I'm sorry to hear some of you have been through it, but at the same time, I know. I know it's all um, for a higher purpose for all of us. Exactly. We have to be on this. We have to be on these paths to learn what we need to learn and grow into who we're meant to be. <laughs> I'm just reading through right now. Um, and if anybody has any thoughts or questions, please feel free to send them in. Yes, there is no one coming to save us. Ooh, that was a big one, Caitlin. <laughs> it is our responsibility to heal our wounds and not for anybody else, right? It's for ourselves. We owe that, we owe that to ourselves. Do you think being friends with other people is necessary? Yes. <laughs> Relationships are life itself, in my humble opinion. Life is only relationship. Otherwise, why would we be in a physical body? <laughs> what are your major future plans? <laughs> Man, it's been quite a theme from in my life this last week or two. That whole phrase, man makes plans, God laughs. <laughs> yeah. I don't try to plan things anymore. I really don't. <laughs> I plan like maximum usually like a few days ahead because <laughs> that's that's all i know so much so much of my life is in this um container for rapid transformation and change and i cannot keep up with it if i try so i gotta surrender and go with the flow yes saranka exactly you're on you are the person that's always going to be there you're the only thing that exists <laughs> that's the truth right when we're talking at an advaita oneness level we are the only thing that exists. It's all about the, the relationship with the self. I've realized from growing up in situations like this how much you have to unlearn and it's hard for me to tell exactly what a real healthy relationship looks like. Thank you for sharing. Yes, I feel you on that. Um, that's why it's really helpful. It really is to have examples, to start looking for examples of healthy relationships. We have to see it. We're, we're learners. Um, we're human beings learn by like in, through mirror neurons. We learn by seeing, right? We're very visual creatures. So it really helps to start um, 
like having people around you or at least online that are great examples of this I will share I love the page um, rising woman rising woman is one of my favorite pages that talks about all this kind of stuff it's all about relationships about but from a spiritual angle it's not just psychology it's like spiritual psychology it's a beautiful super empowering um, the holistic psychologist on Instagram is also an amazing account via talking about all this kind of stuff and codependency and yeah just it's beautiful so that those kind of things help me a lot um and i think again the more that we cultivate though a healthy relationship with ourselves, you'll start to see that the beings who come around you more and more are in healthy spaces with themselves um healthy spaces with each other um and so like now at this point in my life it's kind of crazy because 10 years ago i never would have known that my reality I currently live in is possible. Like I literally would not have believed believed it, you know? And now I'm surrounded by so many healthy relationships. I experience very healthy relationships in a lot of dimensions. And even the kind of problems that I have nowadays in my relationships are very relative, very minor, so to speak, or subtle, more subtle than any type of extreme situation like what I described going through in childhood and all that, right? So. It's, it's like, just keep doing that, that self-reflection, that work. And again, like, don't be scared to ask for help from the right people. You know, it's a beautiful way to learn. Yeah, you guys, oh, nice. You guys follow Rising Woman too. She's awesome. Do you think is necessary to be friends with someone you're no, no longer close with because of a feud in the past? No, I mean, all friendships aren't meant to last forever. All relationships aren't meant to last forever. Really, all of them are only temporary, right? <laughs> I think that's one of the biggest lessons that I've been being taught by life over the past few years, man. <laughs> really, really, whatever you think is, is permanent is usually not permanent, right? But nothing real is ever lost. Even when relationships fade away, it doesn't mean love ever goes anywhere, right? Sometimes the dynamic of our relationship has to change, but, and we have to allow it to happen, but it doesn't mean that love is lost or that person is lost to us. It, no, it doesn't. It just means that now we've created a new way of existing, a new boundary, a new type of relationship, right? Any other questions, guys? Yeah, I, you know, that was a big lesson this year, right? For probably a lot of us. I mean, I know so many people during COVID and during lockdown in general, they, they, they faced a lot of um, endings, right? Endings of relationships. I myself did, you know, going through divorce and um, so many different relationship dynamics in my life changing um, has been a very intense process, you know, but learning learning a lot, learning a whole lot as I go and just being reflected back to me about um, the importance of embracing aloneness, you know, when it's being called upon us. And for me, coming into the space where I don't feel like I need any type of validation in relationships. Um, and that's something I'm working on. That's something I'm working on right now. Uh, Cause I'm a, I'm a big lover. I'm a big, um, relationship person. I always have been. I'm just a relationship being. Um, but that being said, even like defining myself in that way, right, is can be limiting. And so that's something I'm, <laughs> I'm learning to work on right now myself. I'm thinking of going down a path of Ayurvedic practitioner. 100%. That's what I did. I highly recommend it. Um, I went to school in California, though. So you would have to be local if I could recommend you that. Um, yeah, exactly. Is it possible for an atheist to be spiritual? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Within Hinduism, within Sanatana Dharma, there are atheists because it's cosmology. It's the science of living and existing as we are. Um, and it's beyond any framework of religion and it doesn't require belief. So there are atheists within um, Hindu, Hinduism actually, Hindu atheists uh, exist very much so.
What is your take on manifesting by writing? Which is 555 technique. It can definitely be powerful. I don't personally do that kind of manifestation though. Oh, that's beautiful. I'm so happy to hear that you found acceptance in Hinduism. It's a very open, uh, very, very open path for gender and sexuality and all of that. Massive relationship shift for me also. A lot of deep lessons being learned, but in healthy ways, always sending love to those who have been part of our path. Yes, I agree. I agree. Sometimes we just have to draw new new boundaries, right? Have some distance sometimes for, for allowing ourselves to heal and for others to heal. Would you still grow jatas? Um, I definitely probably will again one day. I don't have any plans right now though. Do I worship the universe? I mean, some people don't really connect through worship. You don't necessarily have to worship anything, but you can be um, connected in so many other ways, right? But theoretically, yes, if you if you kind of connect to the formlessness, the power of just existence and, and being, you know, beingness, you can absolutely connect to that space and, and, and you know, have gratitude towards it. Are you good? Yes, I am good. I am good. I'm processing a lot, honestly, but good, good, <laughs> good nonetheless. Yeah, Devin, of course. And thanks, Elise. Appreciate it. What do you think of the woman Saint Ananda Mai? Oh, so beautiful. She's amazing. Such a such a powerful enlightened being. Hello, welcome. Thanks for joining. Uh, do you think that Hindus should have more kids? Yes, hundred percent, hundred percent. If we want the world to become non-violent, respectful of the earth, tolerant of one another, other religions, under other genders, sexualities, ethnicities, etc. Hinduism is the way forward because it, it's all encompassing. So I think the more and more children raised in that philosophy is only gonna, gonna help. Oh, I'm glad you had turmeric tea. That's really great. It's a, it's very, very healing. Yeah, I know I respect Yogananda's uh, tradition and lineage a lot. There's there's reasons I don't personally practice it. Um, I find extreme importance and value on having a living master, a living guru who doesn't allow teachings to get diluted and watered down, which often happens after um, a master passes and the organization kind of takes a life of its own, you know? Does validating yourself help heal externalizing validation? For sure, right? It's it's not even, um, I mean, yes, you could say validating, but more like that ultimate self-love, right? Really knowing who we are and giving ourselves love in all the ways that we think that we need from somebody else. We never do, right? We can give it to ourselves. Yeah, Kieran, um, nothing is limited. Nothing is limited, right, to any one framework. See, the, the key thing to know, though, is that sometimes a lot of people don't don't realize, right, is like Hinduism, Sanatana Dharma, is all-encompassing. Like, it literally is the path that says, I, I accept all paths, I accept all modalities. So there's infinite possibility and freedom within it to do any type of practice or exploration. Uh, that's why I love it because it's it's the ultimate freedom. It's the ultimate liberation. It's really a la the anti label label, <laughs> you know, to call yourself. Um, and so yeah, I definitely do. I love I love doing tarot and oracle cards. I do those for for myself primarily. Um, I love doing certain witchcraft practices that are um, pagan in nature. I do a lot of different kind of things, but still primarily. Um, kind of Sanatana Dharma practices like puja and yoga, meditation. Well, I think I talked enough for today, guys. <laughs> I really appreciate you all. Um, once again, once again, please check out the workshop. I hope that it resonates with some of you. I would really love to connect with you guys deeper there and I will get to see you on Zoom, which is the one thing I hate about YouTube. I really, really want to uh, see you guys face to face and go more in depth with this topic, but also give you guys the tools to how we can use diet, herbs, lifestyle for immunity building during this time and 
kind of with the pandemic, everything happening that I'm not allowed to talk about related to the pandemic, um, how to fortify ourselves naturally and how to strengthen our sovereignty. So very excited for that. Check out the Eventbrite on my last video. The link is there in the description to get your, get your tickets. Um, I send you guys so much love, so much love. And you're all in my, my inner space and, and prayers and, um, and thoughts. I really do appreciate you all. I'm just looking back here real quick. Yeah, Caitlin, I'm so glad you're coming. Cannot wait. All right, guys. Nithinan, take care, everybody.